In the last video, we discussed the motivation for copulas. Specifically, we talked through the possibility of being able to combine disparate marginal distributions with a specified dependent structure. Today, we're going to formally introduce the copula function and begin to understand the mathematics of how the copula function allows us to accomplish this goal. Uh, this lecture is slightly theoretical, but it sets us up to understand uh, the rest of the lectures and really build a good framework for how to think about copulas. So the copula can be understood through Sklar's theorem. This is the main theorem of, of uh, copula theory, and it's shown here. Um, so let's define a joint distribution function of two variables, x and y, as h. If, if we have such a joint distribution function, now it could be anything, um, like a multivariate joint, multivariate Gaussian distribution function, um, Sklar's theorem states that we can rewrite that joint distribution function as a function of its marginals f of x and g of y um, and a coupling function c, the copula. So the coupling function is the copula. Uh, and another way to write Sklar's theorem is shown here in the bottom. So in this case, we say that the copula function, which is a, a function of two variables u and v, is equal to the joint distribution function and the inverse CDF of f and g as a function of u and v respectively here. So where this second formulation comes from is if you go back to basic probability theory, uh, you might remember that we can sample data from any distribution uh, and uh, a method to do that is to first generate uniform random numbers and then apply the inverse CDF to those numbers for whatever distribution you want to generate data from. Um, and the uniformly distributed samples are U and V in this case. And X and Y follow the given distribution of F and G. Uh, whatever we want them to be. They could be Gaussian, they could be beta distribution, exponential, and so forth. And so this is just a general way to generate random random numbers uh, that are independent and follow a given distribution. So Sklar's theorem is basically just a way to rewrite a joint distribution as a function of its parts. And the parts are the marginal distribution and the coupling function. So from this first set of equations, we can view copulas from several different perspectives. Um, we can say that C is a function which combines the marginal distributions F and G to create a joint distribution H. That is one perspective of how to view this function. Um, if we look at this equation here, we see that there's a relation there's a relation where somehow c of some arguments is equal to h of some arguments and that is the same thing here and so from that we can say that because h is a joint distribution function that c must also be a joint distribution function and the reason that's important is because a joint distribution function is just a mathematical function like any other function, but it follows certain properties that are very useful. Um, so those properties, in this case, uh, looking at these formulas, we can derive these properties basically. Uh, because C is a function of U and V, and we said earlier that U and V are uniform random variables, then we know that C must be bounded between, the inputs to C must be bounded between zero and one. Um, secondly, because C is a joint distribution function, its marginal distributions can be found by setting the other uh, variable to one. And this is effectively integrating out one of the variables, but remember, we're not working with probability densities here we're working with probably the distributions, so we have to, we just set the other argument to one. Similarly, setting one of the variables to zero yields a zero probability. Uh, this is also just a property of 
joint distribution functions. Um, and then the final property of the copula function is called the two increasing property. And that's given down here. It looks a little bit complicated. Uh, you can work out the math, but what it intuitively is trying to say is that the copula is a function that is always increasing. So let's, let's back up for a quick second. Um, if you have a marginal distribution function, you know that one of the properties, properties is that it is always increasing. A distribution function never decreases. It, it only increases. Now, copula is a distribution function in two dimensions. And so this is a mathematical way of saying that it is always increasing in the two dimensions. And formally, this is called a rectangle inequality. Um, it is there to, inf to kind of remind us that the copula is a distribution function. Now for everyday practitioners, these properties may not be that important. They are important if you're trying to build some new theories or use some of these properties to solve some proofs. Um, we won't be doing that in this lecture series, but it is important to be aware of them. So now that we've gone over some of the basics of copulas, let's take a look at a certain set of copulas, which I will just call them special copulas, but their official names are the freshet hofting bounds. So the freshet hofting bounds are copulas which define the bounds of all possible dependent structures that a copula can, can capture. So let's, let's unpack that statement for a second. If we go back to Sklar's theorem here, we see that a joint distribution function H is equal to its marginals and a coupling function C. So the intuitive way to understand what C is doing is C is imposing a certain dependent structure on its inputs F and G, it's, it's basically saying how are F and G related to each other to produce H. So we could in, interpret C as a dependent structure. And, and that is in fact what it does is it, 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 is a, it is a dependent structure. So now that we have a concept of a dependent structure, you might ask, what are the possible range of dependencies that we can model with this copula construct. And that's what the freshet hofting bounds are telling us, is they're telling us the range of possible dependencies that the copula can model. So the first is the M copula, M of U, V, and this is, called, this is the upper bound of dependence. Um, and why the upper bound is, is a min is, we're not going to get into that um, in this lecture, but this is the upper bound of dependence, and it represents perfect co-monotonic dependence. We'll go through what that means, but for now, you can think of it as this means if I have a copula, or if I, if I have a copula and it is the M copula, this means that the two random, var the variables that are functions of that copula are perfectly dependent on each other in a co-monotonic way. Uh, conversely, let's define the W copula, which is uh, the, the analytical definition of it is here, it's the max of the arguments minus one or zero. And um, this defines the lowest bound, the, the lower bound of dependence that a copula can capture, and it represents counter monotonic random variables. So if two random variables are related to each other and their copula is defined by W, then that means that they are perfectly counter monotonically related. Finally, this statement here, this inequality here, all it is is it's telling us that any copula must lie between these two bounds. So um, I have a range of dependencies that my copulas can model, but they must be bounded by perfect uh, counter monotonicity on the lower end and perfect monotonicity on the upper end. Um, so we'll get into some examples to make this a little bit clearer, but uh, one final very important copula is the independence copula. And 
this copula represents two random variables that are independent of each other. So I could have two marginal distributions. Let's say the tire pressure of all the cars in the world could be one of my distributions. And the, um, let's say that, well, this is uh, the height of trees is another distribution. Those are independent random variables. I can model their dependence with an independence copula. And that is represented by pi, which is shown here. So uh, just to drive home the point of what co-monotonic and counter-monotonic relationships are, remember that the counter-monotonic relationship is captured by the W copula. And these three examples are uh, just one set of small set of examples, which show you what a counter monotonic relationship is. And it's saying that as, as one variable gets bigger uh, here, in this case, the X axis, the other variable gets smaller, but the key and crucial difference is that it does not have to be a linear relationship. So remember that correlation captures uh, a negative correlation would be a negative linear relationship, but you can also have weird shapes like this, uh, slowly decaying curves and so on. And those all fall under the, uh, the counter monotonic bucket. And co-monotonic is just the opposite. It's saying that when one variable goes up, the other variable goes up as well. I've shown three examples of co-monotonic relationships here. There's a linear one, there's a exponential increase, and there's a logarithmic increase. And the key is that they are all increasing in both variables. Uh, okay, so now that we have um, defined this, um, I'll also just quickly define the copula density. Uh, remember earlier that when we were talking about Sklar's theorem, we were talking about distribution functions. Um, but typically when we talk in, in, in probability theory, we, we like to talk about probability density functions. And so we can take the derivative of this, of h of x, y with respect to x and y on both sides and applying the chain rule, what we get is this, because we get that the, the joint density function is equal to the copula density function, which is just the derivative of the copula function as a function of its marginal distribution functions plus or multiplied by their, by their derivatives through the chain rule. And this would just be uh, the density functions here. Um, this will become more important later on. I just wanted to introduce all of the main theoretical aspects in this lecture. So let's take a look at some quick examples that hopefully will start to bring some of these concepts together. We'll go into them in more detail in future lectures. Um, so here, what I'm doing is what I wanted to show was just a quick example of two different copulas and which is, remember, this is the C function, and I've generated samples from this. We, we will go into copula sampling in a different lecture, but in this one, what we should be taking away from this is just the fact that I've noticed, I've labeled on the axes the marginal distributions. So in both of these examples, the marginal distributions are normal distributions with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. But, in this distribution on the left, I've applied a Gaussian copula with a, with a strong correlation, 0 0.99. In this picture on the right, I've applied a different dependent structure to my data. This is called a Clayton copula, and it represents a different kind of dependence. And you can see these two distributions look totally different, but they both have the same marginal distributions. They just have a different dependent structure imposed upon them, the C function that we talked about. And so this is one example of how uh, the formulation allows us to, to generate a wide variety of data and, and we can go the other way too. We can take this data and fit it to a copula function. Um, there's a lot of things that we can do once we understand this concept. Let's go through one more quick example. In this case, I have a Gaussian copula and a Clayton copula again, but instead of using normal marginal distributions, on the x-axis have a beta distribution and on the y-axis have a Cauchy distribution. And remember Cauchy has uh, thick tails and so you can get these uh, numbers that are uh, wildly varying. 
that represent kind of extreme probabilities. And so, again, both these distributions, these samples of these distributions on the left and the right, they have the same marginals, but they are they use different copulas, and you can see that we get completely different data. And so, what we've gone over in this lecture is just a simple uh, introduction to the kind of the theoretical aspects of copulas. Um, in the next few lectures, I'll hope to drive these points home with further examples. We'll go through sampling so you guys can learn how to generate this data. We'll go through fitting where we take data and we fit it to copulas. Um, and we'll be looking forward to getting into all of that in future lectures. So I'll see you there.